Our scripture reading this morning comes from the first letter of John, chapter 3, verses 11 through 24. And I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. You must not be like Cain, who was from the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be astonished, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love one another. Whoever does not love abides in death. All who hate a brother or sister are murderers, and you know that murderers do not have eternal life abiding in them. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit that he has given us. Here ends the reading, Spirit of God, stir up your people. Thanks be to God. You all know my son, Nehemiah. He was the lone boy up here this morning, rocking out and singing. He was very excited about singing this morning. It was super cute. Um, Mark's a little jealous because he hid for the Carson Christmas pageant, and we got him up here on stage. So good job, guys. Uh, he finally got into sports. We couldn't get him to do anything for the longest time, and then we discovered he needed glasses, and now he's all excited. Um, but we finally got him into sports, and he's been trying out all these different sports, and there was a while there where I thought he was going to be like a soccer rocker, and I was super excited about it because I have started to love soccer, and I was excited about watching it, and it was so fun to watch him play. But recently, he has announced that he wants to play basketball for the rest of his life. The problem with this is that I hate basketball. Hate it. I hate it not because I have problems with the game or because I'm worried that my little five-year-old isn't going to grow to be tall enough to actually play basketball for his entire life, but because the games are full of squeaky shoes. <laughs> Drives me nuts. I know, it's such a superficial reason to do anything, but it's true. It makes me crazy. Squeaky shoes make me crazy. So when my son came to me and said, Mom, I love basketball. I'm going to play basketball forever. In my heart of hearts, I had a moment where I went, I could talk him out of this. Yeah, I could do that. But friends, I did not. I did not. Instead, I said, okay, if you want to do this, we got to work on your dribbling. And that's what we've been doing. We've been working on his dribbling and his passing and his shooting because as much as I hate squeaky shoes. As much as I'm going to have to get creative with earplugs so that I can watch him play in high school, I love my son. I love my son. And I will inconvenience myself in order to be with him in those things that he enjoys. See, when the Bible talks to us about love, I think all too often what's happened to us is that we have made the definition of love too small. We've made it far too small. Here in the United States, especially when we talk about love, we tend to be talking about the warm, fuzzy feelings that we have for other people when they're convenient to us, when they do stuff that we like, when they give us flowers or chocolates or, or all that stuff, when they buy us the best Christmas presents. Or at best, we take these verses that we find in the Bible about love and we limit them to our families, to those that we have intimate, interpersonal relationships with. And it's just too small. Honestly, I think that's the problem with a lot of the faith in the United States, is that we've made all of our definitions too small, and we've based it on our personal 
feelings. Do I enjoy this? Do I recognize this? Do I get that warm, fuzzy, tingly, butterfly whatever you want to describe it as feeling? And if I get those good feelings, then that thing must be true. Even when we talk about how we experience God, it's based on how we feel about something. And it's just too small. It's too small a piece of the love that the Bible talks about. The love of the Bible is the love for one another and the love for God, the love that God has for us and that we are called to have for creation and all of humanity and it is large and expansive and it's a verb. It's not a warm, fuzzy feeling in the Bible. It's a verb. There's a chapter in the Bible that I would be willing to gamble if I wasn't a Methodist that you've all heard this chapter at some point in time. It's the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13. Has anybody heard this? Maybe you don't recognize it as that, but here. This is starting in verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Have you heard these verses before? Most often we use them in weddings, and I don't object to that. I'm not saying that. But it's not enough. It's not the only place that these verses should be used. The Bible calls us to have this love, not only for our spouses and our partners and our children, but for the entire world. We are called to make decisions for all of humanity that are sometimes inconvenient to ourselves because we love those around us, because we want to protect or honor or encourage or support those around us, whether they're family or friends or strangers or people who live on the other side of the globe. My favorite example of this is the example of the traffic laws. How many of you have ever driven in your life? Any, anybody? Car? Car? No? Got some people shaking their heads. Apparently we got a bunch of Luddites in the 1030 service. If you don't know what a Luddite is, you can Google it. It's all good. Okay. Either, either you're a Luddite or a liar. Take your pick. Okay, we're going with liar. Sounds good. All right. If you've ever driven anywhere, you know that there are rules you have to obey when you get behind the wheel of this large machine, right? Hopefully, if you've ever driven anywhere, you stopped at a stop sign or a red light or you turned on your turn signal. Please tell me that the Methodists in town use their turn signals, right? Uh, and, And maybe you obeyed the speed limit. And Methodists, I'll give you the grace. As long as you're within like the five to eight mile range over the speed limit, we'll call it obeying the speed limit, all right? The question is, the question between law and grace, the question of do you do these things because you're told to do them or do you do these things because you love the people around you is did you stop at the stop sign because the cop might catch you? Did you stop at the red light because you don't remember which intersections in Council Bluffs had the, have the red light cameras? Did you follow the speed limit because there might also be an officer and by the way, by the time you see them, they've already clocked your speed, it's too late. Or do you stop at crosswalks and stop at stop lines, signs and stop at red lights because there's other people on the road and you're driving a death machine and you love the people around you and you love the people riding in the car with you and you recognize that by making these decisions, even if they slow you down, even if it's a little inconvenient to stop in this moment, it keeps the people around you safe. That's the difference between the law and love, and the Bible calls us to treat our entire lives like we're obeying traffic laws because we love those around us. Sometimes love means hearing and accepting uncomfortable truths about how the world is, about the systems that we participate in, maybe even benefit from or enjoy, have not been loving at all to all people. Sometimes love means working to change those things around us, even if it's inconvenient for us. And by the way, just a warning, it will only be inconvenience. Love will never cause us to harm somebody else in order to help somebody else. 
Love is also, by the way, not endless permission giving and enabling. This is also not love. Love is boundaries and accountability and truth telling and seeking the flourishing of those around us. Love is the very nature of God, and we see God doing all of these things. Supporting and expecting and holding people accountable for their growth. And 1 John tells us that love has always, always been the message of God. The God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament have the same message and the same nature, and that nature is love. Now, there's a part that really jumped out at me when I was preparing this sermon in the scripture reading that I had never thought about before. But the author of 1 John tells us that the lack of love is death. Now, this doesn't mean physical bodily death. That's not what he's talking about here. Because he believes just as we believe that physical bodily death is not the end of our life, is it? We believe in eternal life. As a church, we believe in eternal life. Maybe you struggle with what's coming after death, but as a church, we believe in eternal life. What he's talking about is the death of the soul. And the death of the soul is a place that we define as hell. Hell is the place where God is not. And did you know that you can experience hell while still alive? That's what the author is saying. The author is saying that where love is not, God is not, and that place is hell. And if we put that in combination with some of the other things that Paul has said and James has said and John has said in other places, we recognize that it doesn't matter how bright and shiny and beautiful it looks on the outside. If love is not there, it is death and hell. That beautiful 1 Corinthians love chapter that we we love to read It's meant to be read in combination with 1 Corinthians 12. Love is a spiritual gift. And it doesn't matter how good anyone preaches or sings or runs the slides. If they don't do it out of love, God is not there. Because God's very nature is love. And if death and hell are places where God is not and it can happen here on earth, then we also need to acknowledge that it can be torture to try to live without love. And honestly, the authors of the Bible would probably argue that that's not even living. So this Christmas season, I invite us all to expand our understanding of love. To not only think about the love that we have for those we like and want to spend time with, but to think about the love that we have for the whole world to live in a place where we take this 1 Corinthians 13 and we take other verses of the Bible and we allow ourselves to demonstrate that to the world around us, even if it's a little bit inconvenient. And by allowing ourselves to experience the love of God and then to be the love of God out in the world, the world will experience and come to know Jesus Christ as Jesus was truly meant to be. And I know I say this a lot, but it is so true. The world needs us to be that kind of love because they're not getting it. They're not getting it from a lot of places. There's been a lot of pain in the last couple weeks out in the world, and and it's because of this lack of love. The world needs to hear again anew the love that God has for them, and they need to experience it through us so that they can come to know Jesus Christ as he truly is. Amen? Amen.